Live from Dublin, Ireland, it's theCUBE. Covering Hadoop Summit Europe 2016. Brought to you by Hortonworks. Now your hosts, John Furrier and Dave Vellante. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live in Dublin, Ireland on the ground for live special CUBE presentation. The CUBE, SiliconANGLE's flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, my co-host Dave Vellante. Our next guest, guest is Scott now, CTO of Hortonworks, back on the CUBE. We were here together, uh, not here, but in Silicon Valley for Big Data Week, which consists of two events, our event, Big Data SV, right. and Hadoop World. So we chat a lot about the stuff going on there. What's changed in two weeks? <laughs> Obviously European, different conversations yeah, out here absolutely. than in the States. You know, uh, what well, announcements do you guys? You know, in like five minutes things change, and that's the great thing about this market, right? The agility uh, that we have there, and we've had a couple of big announcements this week. We've, uh, we've announced two major partnerships, we've announced some additional technology uh, in the last two weeks, and you know what, if we get together in two more weeks, there'll probably be even more to talk about. <laughs> so obviously the big thing around we're hearing is Spark and partnering, integration. These are kind of like data points that are people connecting around for the next generation of how fast acceleration will take place for the big data applications. Cloud was a big theme of that. Spark is a big part of that. What is the connected data platform technically in terms of your, from your position, the CTO, what are the key underpinnings for this connected data platform? You know, the key thing in there really, the word is platform. So in, in a rapidly changing market, which obviously we're in, where there are new tools, there are new requirements and new applications every day, the key thing that we think that makes it sustainable is that the fact that there is a central platform that can go through this evolution and agility and remain you know, basically the platform so that applications don't have to be rewritten and rehosted every time there's a new shiny object, right? So platform is really the key, making it extensible, making common security, common data governance, common implementation, common operation so that uh, customers who are going down this path with us can really future-proof the business by making sure they have a sustainable platform into which new, new projects, new options, new applications can be built and they know because of our open community model that we'll support any of those things that come along. I want to ask you a specific question around this connected platform because I think this is a winning strategy you guys have. I know you got your meat and potatoes, your core engine, and you got the emerging group which we discussed at Big Data SV. Um, but Bringing it all together under one is really key, especially around the open source aspect, because community will win the day. No matter who's involved, whether it's a data warehousing, pre-existing guys, to the new school coming in developers, if you don't have a community, you won't be a winner. So I got to ask you, and this is what we talked about, a number of Apache projects that go into each distribution grows every year. So Cloudera tells us that 50% of the engineering effort goes into each incremental project that's towards interoperability, 50%, okay? Um, why not 100%, <laughs> okay? Is that because they have other priorities? Do you guys have a similar philosophy? Well, Are you putting 50% yeah. of your time into open source and 50% into something else? I don't understand. Well, there's, there's a significant effort that goes into interoperability and building the platform. So obviously I said I think our differentiation yeah. is the fact that it's a platform and not a collection of different projects that don't speak with each other. So there is obviously going to be some work that, that goes into that. I think the difference really comes along because of our ability to really work with the community and within the community entirely in open source to actually help each of the projects do some of the interoperability themselves and to think about themselves as part of a bigger thing where uh, we're not confused or, or have different proprietary things that we have to do manually and expend engineering resource in. We look at the whole thing as 100% open and we actually influence the community to make those things work so together. So Flutter has platform. proprietary it, it would seem that way. Okay, so okay. So with that being said, inherently then you're saying is your connected data platform with 100% open source is inherently interoperable because it's open source and customers can figure out how to interrupt with themselves. That is, that is what we deliver, is that interoperability. So follow up question on that because the cloud guys generally at Amazon specifically seem to be kind of cherry picking on the big data innovation and building a data pipeline that's a set of services, pretty simple and, and easy to use. Is the deck stacked in their favor from the standpoint of adoption because of that dynamic? Or would you argue that the richness of your ecosystem is going to trump that simplicity? I wonder if you could square that circle. 
Yeah, you know, and it's interesting, right? Uh, I think that obviously across the landscape and some of the cloud providers, there's a lot of really good stuff going on <laughs> out there, right? And, and one of the things, uh, there, there's one strategy that says, let me do something that's really simple, that's very small, very contained, as an easy on-ramp for customers who are just sticking their toe in the water and trying out these new uh, kinds of applications. The trouble becomes, obviously, that if, if those things don't operate together as a platform, over time they become very expensive to maintain and manage. Forget the cost of the cloud infrastructure, just for companies to reconcile 37 different applications that don't talk with each other that don't use common data sources becomes unsustainable. So, you know, we've chosen a platform uh, kind of strategy, and I think one of the things that you'll, you'll see us working on is, is ways to package that platform to make the simple onboarding easier, right? So, uh, one of the announcements that we made this week, uh, the partnership with SyncSort for uh, DMXH, is a, is a really nice way to package ETL onboarding from legacy systems, right? So customers who are building data lakes, one of the things they want to do is not only get new and emerging data into the data lake, but they want to pull in some of the legacy data from their operational systems, right, to get better analytics. Uh, the DMXH is an easy button for that. So you'll see us looking at opportunities where we can make it easier to either onboard data, easier to build applications, but not lose sight of the fact that it's got to be an integrated platform for sustainability over time. So that's a solution that you guys, or is that more a go-to-market, what, what is that? Uh, it, it is actually a, uh, a go-to-market, so we can resell kind of as a single vendor a package of the, the SyncSort uh, solution along with uh, Hortonworks data platform. And it goes together as, a, as an ETL uh, onboarding for legacy data. And then you made another announcement with Pivotal, yeah. specific to Hawk, correct? Yeah. What, what's that all about? So yeah, so we made a, a, a big partnership announcement about Pivotal. Obviously, Pivotal is adopting um, uh, HDP as kind of the core uh, distribution for Hadoop inside of, of those applications. And we also have the ability to deploy um, Apache Hawk, the, uh, the open community version of Hawk, as another data access engine. So this gets also to the notion that we're not building individual uh, pieces, but in fact we're building a platform. Having Hawk in our portfolio is another data access engine for our customers to use without having to change platform, without having to rewrite all of their underlying infrastructure, but now gives them another option to plug this tool in where they have specific applications that might take advantage of that functionality. Um, at the same time, and we've gotten some questions, right? This, we're not abandoning Hive, right? It, it's not the tool, it's another tool. Right, and so there are a lot of advantages that Hawk brings to the table. There are a lot of advantages Hive brings to the table, Spark, HBase. We want to have them all be part of that platform. So you mentioned Spark and Hive. So uh, obviously Cloudera sees Spark as an execution, the default execution engine for the ETL with Hive. IBM says Spark's going to hollow out Hadoop. How do you guys see Spark fitting into your roadmap? So again, I don't see it as either or, but and. And I think the real value is in the and. Spark as an engine is extremely powerful and it has some, some use cases where it, it's like the best thing since sliced bread, right? There are other use cases where it's maybe not the best option, and so I don't see it as a one size fits it's all. It's a use case driven scenario. It's a use case driven scenario and it needs to be part of the portfolio and it's obviously uh, integration with our latest um, release of HDP. We have the latest version of Spark supported. Uh, we will continue to, uh, to do that. We also announced uh, in March a partnership with HPE uh, on, uh, on adding to the Spark community and adding functionality mm -hmm. and performance. So we are a believer in the engine, but we don't think it's the only engine. Yeah. What about the conversations that you're in from a technology perspective? Obviously, you we're living in a weird time right now. It's global economy, global communities and open source. Are the conversations different in the States versus here in Europe around some of the data questions? I mean, we've always seen kind of pockets of, you know, country-specific policies and governance and things and whatnot. Now yeah. with IoT data, you know, I think we were talking about telemetry data or telematics data that could be kind of crazy. Yeah, I think, I think the, the biggest difference in the conversation really is around security and privacy where there are so many different and discrete rules and regulations uh, that are very different than in, in the United States. And so we have a lot of conversations about that. Obviously, one of the announcements we made on the integration of Atlas and Ranger integrating uh, metadata tagging and security is something that's of great interest in this part of the world because there are a lot more rules and there's a lot more sophistication in how data can be used and transferred. 
you know, it's interesting, even when I connect uh, uh, here in the hotel and I was Googling something, I got a little notice, you know, because you, of where you are, some data Could have be been privacy. restricted. I'm like, yeah. oh, okay. The Google I thought of that. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, that surrounds us, and I think that is one of the centerpieces of the conversation that we have uh, with customers here in this part of the world. I, I want to ask a security question. I'm, I'm working with the CXOs in the Wikibon community to to basically write a research document on how to communicate with boards of directors on what they need to know about security. With the threat matrix you know, continuously growing, two questions. One is, what's changed that boards need, need to know about specifically? And what's your advice to a CXO communicating to a board about security? How should they approach it? So first question is, what's, what's changed that I should be communicating to the board? You know, I, I don't know that there's anything that's really changed specifically that should be communicated to the board. I think the threats continue to change and mount up, right, as, 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 uh, as people devise new ways to try to infiltrate. Uh, I think it, it is really uh, simple that there are three things that boards need to look at and understand and understand that people are managing. First is, what's my security perimeter? How do I manage the fence? Am I using best practices in managing the fence? Uh, can I report on uh, the threats that have been deterred and so on? The second thing is, how do I compartmentalize the data inside the fence? So that when someone breaks through that fence, and, and, and I'm sorry, the question is not if, yeah. the question is when. When they break through that fence, how do I compartmentalize it so I can minimize the data loss? Yeah. And then third, what are my logging uh, uh, practices so that when number one happens and number two happens, how do I understand what got out? So that I can minimize the impact, so that I can uh, take direct action and not have to go you know, replace every credit card for every a, a, a response plan. A response plan. So, so if, if, I can, if, I can, if I can follow up, um, one of the things that seems to have changed, and I want to test this, is that executives are more open and transparent about the probability of getting hacked. You said it. It's not, it's not if, it's when. Do you see that change? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, when I say that, I get varying degrees of responses. Um, you know, I, and I think there's an acknowledgement that, the, you know, frankly, the world we live in, you should expect that it will happen and hope that it doesn't, as opposed to the other way around, right? Oh, yeah. and, and, and if you think about it the other way around, you're living in a part, partial state of denial, right? Because it, it's out there. So, and, and, and if you believe that that perimeter, that fence, is going to be impenetrable and you don't take action on the inside, then, then the loss downstream is a lot worse. So I tend to be very pragmatic. Plan on it happening and build in that response, build in the compartmentalization, build in the logging. And by the way, if the fence holds up, you've won. Yeah. Ho hope for the best, plan for the worst, as you like Scott, to Scott, I got to ask you the question I asked um, Sean Connolly, who's filling in for Rob Beard uh, earlier. Um, a lot of hands went up when Herb Kinnitz asked the audience, I mean, people are new to Hadoop. You're still seeing a nice in, in, inbound migration of new people coming in the community from a customer standpoint, potential customers for you guys um, and developers. What would you say to those folks around how you guys are different from Cloudera and other approaches. What is the Hortonworks, from a CTO perspective, what is the Hortonworks you know, main value proposition? Well, the value the prop yeah, the value proposition really is in connected data platforms. I think we're the only vendor talking about data at rest and data in motion, and really being able to manage the end-to-end -end process from point of data creation to point of analytic and back with security, with governance, and all that kind of stuff. And then secondly, vapor or shipping product. Shipping product. Okay. That works today. You're talking about it doesn't mean you're doing installed, it. So you are doing it. Installed with customers okay. at scale. Yeah. And that we do it as a 100% open community. So that means that we can continue with the agility, getting new, new and fresh yeah. ideas in there, and be very transparent with our customers and prospects. I said two things, but the third thing, and that is that we're also publicly traded. So we're 100% open. That's right. We are completely transparent. You're open book, literally. We're, we are open to the third power. We're open community. Yes. We're open the ecosystem with all the partners that are that are attending here, and we're open in terms of being public and transparent. What one thing that you would like to share with folks out there that they may not know about Hortonworks or something that could be a misperception on Hortonworks? What would you What would you share? Wow. 
That was a trick question. It I, a trick you question. know, it, it's hard to, to think of just one thing. Well, there's a lot of FUD uh, going around the market. There's a lot of people saying, you know, this, that, and the other thing. They don't, I mean, I, the end-to-end -end thing's interesting. It's shipping, product, end-to-end. -end. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it, it is, it Something is not. Something that people should know about. Before. It is not vaporware, and, and the, the intensity and the energy level that I see every day when I, when I go to work yeah. is just, uh, it, it's very encouraging. It's I, really great to I see. I have one. I think people still think Hortonworks is a services play. Right? There's still a lot of people out there. I mean, people in the community obviously understand it, but there are a lot of sort of people that are obs observers, maybe investors or whatever, that hear somebody say that, that FUD, and you say, know, oh, it's a services play, it's a services business model, it doesn't scale. Yeah, that's it, not true. It, I think that that's completely untrue. Obviously, I voted with my feet and I'm here, and I believe that, that, that we, we sit at a very unique time. When we were together two weeks ago, I talked about the data tipping point and just what's happening just with the sheer volume, velocity, and variety of data. And I believe that the only way to really address that successfully for the long term is the model that we've chosen. And those things coming together, uh, in my mind, it's yeah. a once or twice in a lifetime kind of opportunity. Yeah, and the connected network, I, I was telling Sean, I love that positioning. I think connecting data can give the 360 degree view, because you all the data's out there now. And it's not about mutually exclusive platforms, it's about integration. That we see integration. So, my yeah. final question is, with that being said, what is the white space that you're going after for your plan now? Obviously, the world's evolving, you got IoT, you got end-to-end -end now, but it's not truly end-to-end, -end. it's still changing, it's evolving, it's a moving train, whatever you want to call it, what are the white spaces? I think there, there are a couple of areas of white space. One is in areas of new algorithms and analytics, right, as we get new IoT data in, we're going to have new kinds of analytics evolve, and so, you know, fueling the pump on that to get, to get better insights back to our customers, that's an area of white space. And, uh, and the, uh, the Apache Metron is an example of other white space of, of connected applications where we think an open approach can make sense. Obviously, uh, in cyber, it's a big problem to go solve. The, my simple-minded way to think about it is uh, the bad guys are a community of bad guys working against uh, the perimeters that we're building and telling our boards about. Uh, the good guys combining together into an open source uh, uh, cyber module. Yeah is a really good thing, and we'll look for other areas of opportunity for connected modern data applications, uh, especially where we think there's an open community play. Is that really your last question? I'm taking bets on that. This is like <laughs> the fourth last <laughs> question. I might have a okay. final, final so, question. Okay, good. <laughs> so, I, I, John, you touched on it before when you were, you were talking about Spark, potentially trying to marginalize Hadoop and, and deposition it as just a, just a storage engine, but isn't that kind of what Hadoop was originally <laughs> envisioned to be was a storage engine, and does that bother you? Do you care about that, or is that a misconception? Or Talk about that a little bit. I used to be a teenager, and now I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, obviously, there's still some perception out there that you know, we're still in Hadoop 1.0, which was HDFS and MapReduce, it was batch, single application. You know, the world has changed, right? Uh, we're now multi-tenant, multi-application, we're, we're real-time, we're batch, integrated workloads. Now with, uh, with uh, Hortonworks data flow and our ability to move data, we're also you know, combining data in motion, data in rest. It's a platform decision for modern data architectures. It's not a single purpose thing. Uh, some people may have missed that change in the marketplace. Okay, my final, final <laughs> question is, Okay, if you look, look out Do over I get paid the extra for this? <laughs> <laughs> you can ask me a question. All right. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> no question? Okay. Um, final, final question. Honestly, the show here is, is smaller, okay? Um, the big keynote presentation is from WorldPay. Big player up there. Um, honestly, smaller crowd and intimate in Europe, but that's a real fully, that guy's fully loaded with Hadoop, so that's one of those situations where he's in production, real critical financial transactional thing. Um, can you talk about that and how that, because it seems to be much more telco, a lot of telcos in Europe, so transactional stuff is key, but it's also a pretty big deployment. Why world pay on stage? Was it the security angle? Was it the, the can you share some of the deployment scenarios? Well, I think, I think the big thing is um, showing relevance and gravitas is really important. And, and I think that uh, that was obviously the yeah. intent, and when we go looking for, for those kinds of opportunities, 
um, you know, the folks who are gathered here love hearing from Hortonworks and, and from other vendors and, and solution providers as they're looking at their roadmaps. In the end, the most valuable thing that they can leave with is hearing from others who have gone before them mm -hmm. and done it and been successful, creating that credibility. Uh, you know, one of the great things about the show, not just the, uh, the keynotes and the speeches and the sessions, is a networking opportunity where folks yeah. can actually talk with others who have implemented uh, and get the real deal. And, and so, you know, I think with any of these shows, hearing from the vendors is really great. I love presenting from time to time, but, you know, hearing from folks who have done it is relevant and we'll continue to push that uh, for this event, this event next year, the event that we have coming up in San Jose. Scott, thanks for sharing the insight on theCUBE. It's great, great to see, hear from you, and also as a CTO, you have a good view into a lot of the frontline activity as well as inside the, uh, the, the kingdom of the community and the Horton work, so thanks for your time. Thanks for having me back. Okay, we are here live in London, I mean Dublin, not London, <laughs> Dublin, Ireland, for the Cube special presentation of Hadoop Summit 2016. We'll be right back with more live coverage after this short break.